Hello, my name is Howard Hart, host of Speaking Opera. This episode is going to be slightly different than previous ones. In it, I interview opera great Gino Quilico, who discusses his career and relationship with his father, Louis Quilico. After my conversation with Gino, you will hear an interview I did with Louis Quilico from 1981. Then the episode will end with a musical selection of father and son with Lena Quilico at the piano. I hope you enjoy. It's not a problem. I'm, I'm going to be in Toronto because a friend of mine is singing there. And I'm with a friend and he and he mentioned that he would like to go to the Traviata, which is on May 7th in Montreal. They're doing Traviata. Ah, okay. So I thought you're there. I'm if there. I'm here, no problem. If I'm here, okay. no problem. <laughs> okay, great. So I just thought I would put that up. And to keep a promise, uh, Charlie Castronovo made me promise that he would that I would say hello and he sends oh, his love and loves yes. singing Don Giovanni with you. <laughs> oh yes, yes. My God, his career really took off after that, too. I feel like uh, I'm, you know, he's like a little baby next to me, you know. <laughs> <laughs> I don't you're pretty impressive. I followed your career, and uh, although we've never met, I went to as much as possible. And my, my desert island Carmen is the Carmen that you're on with uh, Ewing. I love oh, that's with my Maria favorite. Ewing, yes, that's, yes, and Lima. Oh my God, you three there's a lot right. of them because that that particular year, I think I wanted to kill my agents because they booked me. I swear, this is like. I had nothing but Carmen's all year long. I was so sick of Escamillo. I never wanted to. I said to my agents, don't you ever do that to me again. I don't want to sing Escamillo. Please give me a break because I wound <laughs> up doing it. And not just like, you know, like in one place. I was I did the ones at Covent Garden. Then I did it at the Paris Opera. And then I did it at the Festival d'Orange. And they were also videotaped. So there's also these other videotapes of it. Then I wound up doing it out in Tokyo, San Francisco, at the Met. It was like Dallas, Texas. It was like crazy. I was just doing Escamillos. And Escamillos is a wonderful role, but not one of those roles that you really can put your teeth into, you know, like Don Giovanni or Figaro on the Barber's yeah. Hill, you know. So uh, so I was, uh, I was so happy that, but thank God now I'm too fat to sing the bullfighter. You know, I'm more <laughs> the bull today. I'm the bull today, you know. <laughs> I don't know. It's, it was, that's a, I just love the performance. I have many of the things of your videos and yeah. I did see you at the mat. I, I wish I had seen your Don Giovanni. I think you would have, I can't even imagine how you must have been incredible. Really, I see the little snippets on the video. I yeah, want to, I, I want to say more. Think, <laughs> yeah, I, 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 I think I did. I would have because it's it's the the one of the first roles I ever sang was Don Giovanni. Strangely enough, it was in school at the University of Toronto, mm -hmm. and uh, I'm a student, and they saw my potential, I guess, and they said, "Oh well, here we go. We've got a, a Giovanni right here in the school." So we did Don Giovanni in school, and and it was. It was uh, an incredible experience for me. So when I finally got to do it on stage with, well, of course, at school, it was on stage with real audience. But in the professional world, that was also uh, wonderful. I love that role because there's just so many ways to interpret it. And I, um, it's not a hard singing role. It's a hard acting role. That's why I love it. So what, uh, now you have me curious, I have to ask you this question before I'll ask you the question <laughs> about your father. Um, is John Giovanni a bad boy? <laughs> yeah. Uh, yeah, you read the book, yeah. <laughs> I read the book and I love the opera. <laughs> yeah, the bad boy, yes. Well, Giovanni, let's say, maybe let's say in the beginning of my career was a bit of a wild, crazy card. You know, I was before my career started, and but I, I had to straighten things out for the career. But I was always a little bit of a daredevil in my life, you know, until I learned when we start getting pains and hurting ourselves and getting mm -hmm. older, we say, oh, we're not invincible anymore, you know. So, <laughs> so the jumping around on stage and I was very physical, very physical, mm -hmm. you know, I'm the last time I hurt myself on stage is when I realized it was the ghost of Versailles, the Metropolitan Opera. Mm -hmm. And I did a I did a flip on stage and landed on my coccyx and the, on my back and 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 it was I really injured myself and in Giovanni I actually broke my elbows my both my elbows crushed my elbows wow. and then 
happens inside San Francisco opera. Yeah, I kind of took it. I had a tradition that where I, uh, I like to say, if you see a lot of other Giovannis, right? And you see them happen to go up the stairs to stab the commendatore and then freeze and do a straight backfall. That I think I'm the one who created that. <laughs> because <laughs> Every Giovanni, I would do that. And I knew how to fall straight on my back because I used to do judo when I was a kid. So I, I knew how to break the fall and not hurt myself. But this particular performance, I was very angry. I had just lost my mother to cancer. So I took it up. I, uh, when you're mad, you take it against yourself. And I kind of like did the back fall. And I, instead of breaking the fall, I slammed my elbows down this way and just crushed both, both oh. all my nerves and both elbows. And my hands were frozen for a month, I think. And it was, a uh, it was not a pleasant experience, but, um, I learned that I have to stop doing those silly things. <laughs> that's amazing. amazing yeah crazy what we do in the world of opera sometimes if only people knew <laughs> <laughs> i did want to say um if you have anything that you want to have edited out afterwards um you can let me know uh, i think otherwise i'll keep everything and we'll use it you know as we go along i'm my, my life is are. an open book my life is an open book there's no I, secret. oh so, exactly as you can we, see in the third act you see i divulge a lot of my crazy life uh, and we have a few things in common i must say <laughs> i i have my struggles with i worked in the record business for a long time in in recordings and uh it was involved around uh, imported recordings and that's how i actually met your father was through mm -hmm. a friend of mine who uh, owned v, uh, vai the video uh okay. at that time ernie gilbert and he called me and asked me to interview your father he said uh, he had heard that I had interviewed some other singers and um, he had heard one of them on the radio, apparently. And he said, do you think he would interview me? And so I interviewed him at Ernie's house on uh, his apartment, had a small library on in the West 70s in New York City. And I have never laughed like that. He was a very funny man, <laughs> very charming. Yeah, uh, everybody about twice loved my size. I'm not a big guy. I believe five, three. Your dad was a big man. But what a charmer, what a nice man, very kind, very kind. And, and yeah, he, uh, he, he was coming. a good guy. A lot of people loved him from the directors to the stage hands to the to that was one lesson I learned from him that I I I treat everybody equal in the in the opera world, in the opera houses and everything. And that's the way he was. And I would arrive play, someplace and they they all go like from the stage hand to some assistant or whatever. They go, oh, you're Louis' son. You're Louis' son. And they they all love my father. So it, it was a great thing. Only a few times I met. He he had a couple of hitches with conductors sometimes. And oh. Oh anything, yeah, so one I, I'll just tell a real quick story. I don't think it's in the book. Uh it's it, you know, I'm having trouble with this conductor. He's just being terribly nasty to me and everything and I'm going, what's going on here? I don't get it, you know, and mm -hmm. so I call my father and I say, "Hey dad, listen, I'm working with this conductor and he's being terribly." And he goes, "Oh, that SOB." Yeah. <laughs> so I understood right away. <laughs> he had a fight with that guy and that guy wasn't mm -hmm. happy working with the sun so it was uh <laughs> now i understand why he's being nasty to me but otherwise everybody loved him just everybody loved him i thought was this a conductor at la scala by any chance oh no that was another one <laughs> <laughs> i know that one and with a wife a younger wife that story yeah that's that was uh that was really hard because again it it see it's funny how things happen to you when it's like that was my mother couldn't come to my debut at la scala because she uh she was now very ill with the cancer and uh if there's anybody you know my mother was the the real backbone of the quilico family and she she you know she really taught every single role to my father and and a lot of my roles till she passed and uh she always said, because my father never sang at La Scala, she said, Aquilico will make it to La Scala. So this was my debut, and I was so sad she couldn't come. But I was so grateful that I had a great success there. But like I was I was going through difficult times though, because <laughs> this conductor was not being nice to me, you know. And 
But thank God for Mirela Freni, because Mirela really saved my life there too. You know, she said, Gino, calm down. Don't let it get to you. And she held my hand and uh, at a moment of crisis when I was ready to walk out on La Scala, you know, so, <laughs> so we're good friends. And, and then again, I, like I said, I wanted to do this debut for my mother. It was very important. That's why the book starts with that. Starts with La Boheme, my debut, and my mother talking about uh, my debut at La Scala. And the hot-headed Gino. <laughs> <laughs> with that out the conductor. I, I actually have, I'm a huge fan of his conducting, but I have to admit the story was engaging and I was fascinated by his younger wife, who I actually have liked in some live recordings I've heard. So it was an interesting uh it was a situation. <laughs> Children of famous singers who follow in their parents' footsteps don't always succeed. You are an exception. Can you provide any, any insight into how your father's career influenced your own and whether it helped or created challenges? How's that for a question? <laughs> That's a lot of answers there. There's a lot of things to be said. Well, yeah, of course, uh, grow, first of all, growing up with a father who's an international opera star and a mother who's a concert pianist who's devoted her career to, to, to my father, I grew up in, surrounded by music, you know, I, I do concerts now more than opera, and in my concerts I talk to the audience and one of the songs I, I break out and I sing is, uh, uh, is uh, Leur Exquise by Renaldo Ann. And I basically use this song to explain to the audience how my mother was seated at the piano, how my father was in the curve of the piano, and little Gino was underneath the piano listening to my father and mother play this Heure Exquise, which is the exquisite hour. Well, I, I like to tell the audience at this point in my concert, I like to tell them that I had thousands of exquisite hours underneath the piano from the age of six four five six seven eight nine I just you know dad would rehearse in the living room with mom and I had my private little concerts underneath the piano so this kind of upbringing in music is like an apprenticeship in a way so maybe this is a reason why I succeeded because music was inbred with me and then and then uh, and then finally the day, well, like all teenagers, I picked up a guitar and I wanted to be cool. The hair went long. I started playing, you know, pop music and everything. And then I guess my calling came back and 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 I I desired to sing opera. But it was through a, an accidental situation where my father said they're looking for extra chorus in the Canadian Opera Company, and it paying $2,000 for the whole bit. And I said, wow, in my, back in those years, $2,000 was a lot of money. So I did it. And when I did it, I never had that experience. Of, and all they wanted was a guy that looked good and who can carry a tune, you know, who could sing the notes. It didn't have to be a great voice. So I did it. And But what really seduced me was the makeup the costumes, and finally being on stage, and I never had been in front of 3,000 people applauding. So this is where we say very often, a lot of singers say, I got the, the, the needle or the drug, you know, the drug that I need. This is where I said to my father, I want to try to become an opera singer. Do you think I can sing? And he did bring me down in the studio made me sing a couple of notes and then he said on one note he says yeah you have a voice you can do it so I, I just said okay dad let's go <laughs> started it all and then my mother there so I was very fortunate that way too the apprenticeship goes with a, a pianist and a, and a father that taught me my technique vocal technique my mother the music so I really got the, the the golden plate, not the silver plate, the golden plate or the golden spoon and everything. And uh, I understood, like every son, I first fought with my father. We had, you know, confrontation. And But I understood if there was somebody that was going to teach me correctly how to sing, this was the man. So I abandoned my hard head and I, I listened to everything he told me and within two years 
I was solid as the rock in technique. I didn't have a lot of repertoire because obviously I had never studied that, you know, operas, but I knew how to sing. So repertoire was very easy to accumulate. So I took off like a, like a, like a, I don't know how you say that in English, a, an arrow, like, you know, phew, went like a rocket. Whoa, my mm -hmm. career went. By the time I was 30 years old, I almost sang in every major opera house in the world. So, um, and then, you know, the fortunate part was, is that I was singing Figaro's. Elisierda. I was singing, Doni let's put it in composers better, Donizetti, Rossini, Mozart. I didn't do any Verdi. And um, so the comparison was very difficult for people to say, oh, he's not like his father. There was no comparison. I wasn't singing Verdi operas. If I would have singing Verdi operas, then yeah, because my father was Mr. Verdi or Mr. Rigoletto. And um, so I didn't have much challenge that way. The only challenge was, is that when I would go audition, and it was funny because a lot of people after my auditions, they come to me and go, oh, we're so happy that you really have a good voice, you know, because we don't want to be nasty to Louis, you know, because we love Louis. And if his son sings like shit, we're going to have to say, oh, you know, he's OK. You know, <laughs> they were all so happy. That was the first compliment I would get is that you sing great. That's we're so happy, you know, and that was a good beginning for me. So so there wasn't too much difficulties, but. I like to say very often, my father was able to maybe introduce me and things like that, but I had to open up the doors. I had to walk through the doors and prove myself. So that was difficult at times, you know, but but nevertheless, uh, I proved myself. I went through the doors and and I was I succeeded. And so I I don't feel and I never had jealousies or my father or you know never confrontation. I've been asked that that question especially when we sang together on stage was there a no, it was like father and son. We loved each other. We wanted to help each other as much as possible. So so no, that I think I've answered all the questions, but it took you a long time. You did very well. <laughs> Yeah. I, I wanted to mention something you have not heard. No one, I believe, has heard um, the interview I did with him since December of 1981. What's interesting is he was singing uh, Rigoletto at the Met, and you were making your debut in Paris, I believe. And was it a debut in Barbara of Seville, Barbiere? Barbiere? You were singing at the same time or very close to the same time. You, but it was uh, it was in the beginnings of Paris. Yeah, yeah, right. yeah. yeah, yeah. I remember, uh, well, of course, Rigoletto. I mean, that was his role. He just owned that. And oop, I'm sorry if it went ling ling. That's like oh, that's okay. That's okay. We we have that happen occasionally. Not a problem. But yeah, um, yeah. I remember he came afterwards to he to for uh, when I was singing in Paris, and he he was my he was like my best fan <laughs> so <laughs> would just be applauding in the audience i could hear my father going bravo bravo. <laughs> i wish i could have had him for all my shows you know because <laughs> it was a great support and uh yeah no these were special times especially paris for me because paris was where i first recognized really my father as an opera singer where i saw him really perform at the old Paris Opera House, you know, the Palais Garnier, and where I I shed tears and everything when he died in Don Carlos. And uh, as a son, you know what, you're watching your son, your father, and he's singing this gorgeous aria and he's going to die at the end. And I remember telling him uh, the first time I said, Dad, please don't ever sing that role again. <laughs> I don't want to see you die. <laughs> so but, did you bring it? So I did. <laughs> I did. Sing that. I sang it at Covent Garden. That's where I made my debut as Don Carlos, yes, as Rodrigo in Don Carlos. Since you brought up uh, shedding tears and your father and uh, stories of him, uh, like in the Don Carlo, which is very vivid in my memory, as I've just read this book, yes. which I think you would like to share with us something about the book. 
Absolutely. I'd like to explain that w- this is not a book, uh, as you read it, it's not a book about Gino did this and Louis did that and Lena. No, it's a book about really the struggles, I think, and the love and all the the challenges uh, uh, that you we have in the world of opera, but also as a family. And and uh, so it's 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 got a very different approach. Connie Guzzo did a wonderful job. Connie Guzzo McParland, I should say her full name. Uh, she did a great job. And uh, at first she approached me and said, I'd like to write a book. And I said, no, I'm not interested. I mean, what am I? This is boring. My life? No, forget it. No, I'm not interested. So she said, well, let me let me just write a little bit for you. And, and you tell me how you feel about it. You know, so I said, OK, well, go ahead. You write, write something and come back. And she came back and she wrote this bit about my mother. And I just I I broke down into tears as I am a, I'm the very easily to make me cry in my life. <laughs> so I broke into tears and I went, oh my God, there really is a story to be told. So we started this adventure. It took us many years. The book is an opera in three acts. The three acts: my mother, my father, and me. To give another idea, my mother, because she's there. She starts where I'm making my debut, La Scala in La Boheme. We went with a, a theory, a, um, a theme for every act. And my mother's act, her theme is Lena and the Bohemians. So there's a lot of innuendos of La Boheme and she dies like Mimi at the end. And I'm Marcello Coraggio, you know, all this stuff that comparison with an opera, which I found brilliant from what Connie did with this. And then she moves on as mom dies. She moves on to Mr. Rigoletto. Now, also to be mentioned in the book, it's my mother speaking. It's not like she said, it's she is speaking. Now, of course, she passed away. So this comes from all for people to understand. This comes from uh, cassette recordings that I have of me and my mother and my father, because this is how we communicate. We didn't have internet. We didn't have uh, you know, portable phones and all that stuff, we would do either letters or we would send in the mail little cassettes and, and we would have, a, you know, one hour conversations and then they would send it back, you know, and and so this is how we communicate. So I have these in, these and letters that my mother and I exchanged. So we went with all this and, of course, my memory of my mother and and also information from reviews critics blah 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 so that's how we made our research so that it could be lena speaking in, as an in as a real person in the book and then louis louis act is of course mr rigoletto mr rigoletto because he he owned that role he lived it it was part of his life and um and therefore, he takes over and t- starts talking about his life and it intertwines with what my mother said and then his continuation and and uh, uh, talks about me and everything. I'm a little bit everywhere in the book, I think, if I remember well. And finally, he dies in the second act and then I take over in the third act. And the third act is uh, is called, as you said, Don Giovanni meets Jean Valjean. Now, why? Jean, I sang Jean Valjean, Les Miserables. I did 100, uh, over 150 performances of that. It was one of my breakaways into the what we call crossover, crossover world and from the world of opera. And Don Giovanni, well, basically saying that this man, Don Giovanni, this crazy guy, a little bit opera singer who I was, but but I did change before I started to become Jean Valjean. And then Jean Valjean, it's like that you become wise in your life and, you know, and you start becoming, I don't know, a normal person, maybe. <laughs> <laughs> what to say. <laughs> kind of like my act. It's uh, so it, it's a little more spicy. There's a lot of a little bit more, uh, you know, crazy things happening in my act because of this change and I again I'm I'm an open book I have no problem with saying that I did lots and crazy things in my life and uh and then uh that it it it, it ends that way I'm not dead yet so <laughs> so like I hope not or I'm in trouble <laughs> and uh but it's it's a beautiful story it's a beautiful story I'm very proud of it uh, and like every book there's so many things I would have loved to say other things so many we always it's it, it, there's so many things that we can say but we forget and 
certain things. I do have a couple of regrets, but uh, that, uh, but it's okay. I, I let it go. It's all right. You're younger than I am. Trust me, in time, it, it changes again. I, yeah. I love I love the book to be very uh, candid with you. I'm when I read it, I related to a lot of what you said. And as we get older, things let, some things are less important, and love is more important. The relationships with it, the people we have in our lives. I'm glad you say that because I think that's somewhere the the final message is that there's love that keeps us going and everything, you know. And I think that's important. Absolutely. So I'm going to break a tradition. Uh, I, I've, I'm working on my website right now, and uh, I did most of uh, my interviewing in the 1980s. Uh, and I'm doing the website actually this summer. It's a lot of work. I'm doing it with a friend. Uh, and you will be featured on the front page, needless to say, <laughs> of course, where you belong. And uh, it's it will. Uh, I interviewed a number of singers from the Metropolitan, and I kind of put it, in, on cassettes, when you mentioned cassettes, I put it on cassettes and I put them away and thinking I'll never do anything with this. And then now at 78 years old, I am taking all of that and putting it all together so that somebody can have it. I don't that's, know who, but somebody. And your father's, is, your father's interview is amazing, amazing. I think you should make sure you have some Kleenex handy. Ah. He talks about you for a long time and very movingly. Even I get very, but he also tells funny, funny stories. I won't tell you the stories, but I, when I was listening to it. I heard all the stories. I've heard them so many times. And, and he made a lot of people laugh with his story. That's what I loved is that when he would tell those stories, I mean, I, I felt like as though I knew some of these people before I even met them, you know, like Lujan or... Montserrat Caballé, all these people that he worked with, and he has had so many stories to tell and funny ones. And and finally, I meet these people and I'm singing with them. I'm going, oh, my God, you know. <laughs> I actually spoke to your father the other day in my imagination, because in the interview, he said, this man came up to me for, at the Metropolitan. He was very old. He was an old man. He was about 68 years old. And I said, Louis, I'm 78 and I'm doing this for you. Take it easy. <laughs> So I would like to end uh, this particular uh, interview uh, that you were so gracious to do. I know you're getting ready to go to Europe. Um, I'm, I've never played, <laughs> lucky you, I um, have never played music on uh, speaking opera. It's always been speaking and interviews and so forth. I'm going to make an exception. I want to ask you about uh, a song, Chopin, Triesta, Triesta? Tristezza. 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 <laughs> I'll give you a coach. Thank you. Thank you, your coach. Uh, can you tell us about the song? This will be a performance with you, your father, and your mother at the piano. Can you tell us a bit about this? Yes, these are concerts that my mother used to do every year with the uh, with the um, uh, Toronto uh, Symphony Orchestra, and uh, at towards the end, or I think it's at the end, uh, you'll notice that the three of us are singing, but the whole orchestra is sitting in the back listening to us, and we decided to do this because Mom's favorite pian pianist or composer was Chopin. And there's a song that is take, I don't know what opus something, and uh, they put words to it, and it's called Tristezza. And basically, we made it into uh, two voices and piano. And um, it's, I know it's not great quality. So when the audience watches it, uh, just pay attention to one little thing, which is very cute, because I'm singing very high baritone so i sound like a tenor almost in this du duo because that is the baritone so i i had the high voice so i took the high high notes and there's one moment where i break into a da -da 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 -da. and my and if you can see the expression of my father and my mother they're both have these big smiles they're so happy because i got the note i got the note <laughs> and uh 
yeah, so this was a, a beautiful, one of the uh, rare moments of the three of us performing together. And I just like to finish it with that, that um, I do this in my concerts now. I sing that song. I dedicate it to my mother. And it's called Tristezza, which means sadness. I dedicate it to her because it's e triste il mio cor senza di te. My heart is sad without you. So it's basically saying to my mother, I miss you. I miss you very much. So I dedicate it to her every concert I do now. Every concert, any time. <laughs> very good. So I made a good choice without you knowing it. Choice. You made a great choice. Oh, thank you. I want to thank you so much. I know you're getting ready to go to Europe. And I won't say I'm not jealous, especially where I know you're going. <laughs> you're going to Italy, yes. So no. <laughs> the, the the belly part that you don't see below me, that is going to be really happy. <laughs> and congratulations to your son as well. I saw oh, that. Yes, yes. He's a survivor. He he's my he's my hero. He's my hero. I tell you what he's done. If anybody wants to go check that too, Enrico Quilico, the what he's done. It's all over the the internet. So he's a he's a survivor of a severe motorcycle accident and a brain trauma TBI. They called it traumatic brain injury. But he 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 brought himself out of all it took many many years it was very difficult it changed my life very much and and um yeah um he's my hero i'm proud of him and he's in dallas texas now <laughs> postdoc <laughs> <laughs> well congratulations to both of you dad <laughs> it was a pleasure really a pleasure Thank you. I want to thank you. I know your time is, uh, has been uh, tight getting ready to go, but I hope maybe we can uh, meet up in May. We'll see how it goes when oh. I'm in Montreal. So. Good. Thank you so much for your time today. This was delightful. I feel like I've known you for years by reading the book and then <laughs> talking to you. I'm very fortunate. I'm a very lucky man. Thank you so much. Okay, thanks. This has been delightful. You made my day. This is the best thing I've done in a while. Oh, thank you. I feel like I you gave me a gift personally as well for doing this. I really appreciate it. And I know it's appreciated elsewhere as well. Yeah, yeah. Up there. You know what I mean? Absolutely. Yeah. They're watching. They're watching. Look good for 78 years old. <laughs> thank you. <laughs> thank you. And you're still sounding very good because I'm following you. I, you know, we're friends on, on Facebook, but I'm I've also going to YouTube and you sound great. You I don't really get it. Do. Stan, my voice is just getting better and better. I, it I, is this well. I'm saying to people that I don't understand why my voice is getting better and better. It's supposed to get worse as you get older, but mine's getting better. And what's scary is that I'm getting these high notes I never had. I'm, I'm able to sing high notes now. I even mm -hmm. sang once Nessun Dorma and <laughs> Tenor Aria, you know. So I went, well, Whoa. you never know. No, no, no. no. I'm not changing careers now. I've, 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 uh, but I will say one thing at 78. Never say never. That's why I never went too far in the Verdi repertoire, because I'm not a true Verdi baritone. I'm a lyric baritone, and I sing some of the lighter Verdis, like Don Carlos is, mm -hmm. is more lyrical. Uh, I did Ford and Falstaff. The only heavy one I did was Iago. And but Yago, when I I called my father, my father said, Gino, Yago is not dramatic. Don't get mistaken by that. The only place he's dramatic is in the duet with the tenor. Otherwise, even his credo is all like a snake. It's very lyrical, very lyrical. Don't don't get caught into this oh, big baritone voice. And that was it. Otherwise, oh, Balo in Maschera. I did Balo. Balo in Maschera is also kind of a lyric with more importance that's what i am a lyric with uh maturity now but i've never been a verdi which call a true verdi baritone like my father so i i stay away from it you know your, your credo on the uh youtube channel surprised me it's wonderful and it's yeah. sung very lyrically and it works beautifully so yes. your father was right <laughs> i can keep trying to convince people you know but i did it <laughs> Few times a few places and it was a great experience and uh 
Yeah, no, it's, 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 again, it's how you approach things. Uh, Rigoletto is the same. My father said the same thing, but I would never, and I never did, and I never will uh, touch that role. It just belongs to him. It's his role, mm -hmm. you know. And, you know, why do I need to do it when we had Rigoletto, my father, you know, I just, I would not bring anything new to it. And uh, if anything, I would break my neck because I try to sing like my father. <laughs> <laughs> So I'll stick to he, he understands. He understands. <laughs> I'll stick to Figaro. Figaro, Figaro. Oh, that was amazing. When you, the, where is the um the uh video that's on YouTube of you? Is that from Paris or somewhere else? The one where you sing the Lago Effectorum. Is it with Cecilia Bartoli? Yeah. No, no, uh, it's an, a different one. Uh I oh, no, it is with Bartoli. I'm sorry. It is with Bartoli. Right. That's Cecilia Bartoli before she became famous. I know. I saw, And you're so kind to her. I'm thinking this is it was interesting watching it. I will admit I got it just before I did the interview because I wanted to see it. And so I got it. I really enjoyed it. But it was she's very different. It very. Um, she's a baby. A, a, 20, 21 years old, I think, or something like that nobody knew her. And and when when the uh, the funniest part is when the applause would come at the end of the show, it was mm -hmm. like Gino Colico would come out, <laughs> Cecilia Bartoli would come out. They go, oh, okay, mm -hmm. they'd applaud her. Then, like two years later, she got that. She during those two years, she got her contract mm -hmm. with guy and everything. She became the famous Cecilia Bartoli. Right. And then I sang the Barber Seville with her again, and it was mm -hmm. G. Okay, <laughs> oh, for Cecilia. Uh, are you I, sure you got you didn't get more applause than that? I I think so. <laughs> good applause. It, it, I always get good applause as Figaro, but it was just the difference. The big right. was now the great Cecilia Bartoli, you know, right. which is a, which is funny. You see people pass you by in the career. I've I've seen many because I've been around forty five years. I've I've been singing for forty five years, so I I've seen a lot of them kind of babies with me. Just like Castronovo, Castronovo, right. he was mm -hmm. he was a young beginner, and I when he sang Don Ottavio, I said, "Hey, you're going to be a great tenor, you know." And and there you go, he he it's, made a beautiful career. And he's wonderful. He said you were one of the one of the great Don Giovanni's. He remembers singing with you, and he is such a he really is very fond of you. I'm you know he did make me promise to say that, and I met him backstage this year after Bohem. He was so warm and I've been a huge fan for years. He's one of my favorite singers. And I asked him to do an interview in the fall when he does the uh, Balo at the Met. And he said, sure. And I found him. To, he said, call me Charlie. <laughs> I'm Don't happy. Call me Charles. <laughs> I'm happy to hear when, when somebody becomes a famous and they, they stay humble and they He's stay very humble, kind hearted because that, like I said, you recognize that in my father, well, that's how I like to be, and I like to see other colleagues that are like that too. Because it does. It, I, I hate seeing divos and divas. I just, that just does not work well with me. You know, we're all we all started from the bottom, and we all had to climb up. And you know, don't forget. And uh, that that's I'm happy to hear that. And we also sang Lucia together in Los Angeles, I believe. Oh. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm so happy. I saw I saw that he was recently singing at the Met. What was it uh, you just said? In, and I saw him in Bohem. I had never seen him in Bohem before. And the, I have to say, it changes it every time. Mm -hmm. The Fidelli Bohem, right? The big huge... Yeah, they'll never touch that. They'll they'll never touch that if they're smart. That's hugely popular still. I was there for the opening. Turando, they should never touch that and Turando. Turando no. is uh, the most amazing when that curtain goes up in uh. the you just go, wow. <laughs> Do you know, I was there when Ava Martin sang at the opening night of the, because I lived in New York then, and I started to cry when it opened and it was all in white and gold, you know, and that, and it was so beautiful to begin with, even the beginning with all the colors. But I was like, this is the most beautiful thing I've ever seen in my life. I was just like amazing. Most standing ovation every time that curtain opened up. Like, everybody would applaud. Beautiful. It was crazy. 
people love fantasy. They don't need flying bumblebees and rocket ships. And you know, they it's uh, it's a way to escape and or to be in another place for a while. That's beautiful. I know what you're saying. Yeah, it's uh, sometimes it just drives me nuts when they start going into these crazy productions and you know opera is beautiful and the dreamy part of it like you said you know and and all that stuff has to be maintained it's not old-fashioned to do that it's it's just maintaining this classic art form and with its classical look and these are historical moments too right you know don carlos took place in in spain during the uh, the, the, the the what was it the the, the with the the inquisition. church yeah. inquisition and all that you, we need to see that it's a historic i love history books because of that i love to all those old things those old costumes and why put us in space suits or <laughs> what would you really? <laughs> why <laughs> Yeah, but you know we had to do some crazy stuff. But mistakes we, are made, and pe- people, the audience speak though. But that last Tosca they got rid of, which was a horror show. Uh, yeah. they'd gotten rid of the Zeffirelli, then another one which was horrible, and the audiences hated it. And even Gelb admitted it was a mistake. And they now have McVicker do one, and it's traditional, and everybody's happy again because it looks like a church. There's the Virgin Mary, and it's all very. It looks authentic. It looks like you're in in Rome, not in I don't know where you're supposed to be in the other one. Yeah, um, I'm, the, <laughs> yes, I'm going to the Castel Sant'Angelo when we arrive in Rome. Uh, yeah, we have a whole thing set up to to visit uh, also the the um, the underground of the castle. So mm-hmm. yeah. it's a wonderful place. Fascinated with with all this stuff. So she she worked out our whole trip. <laughs> <laughs> You'll have a good time. Have a lot of good food because you in Italy, it's hard not to. <laughs> the food is so amazing. And I'm a huge coffee fan. Nobody makes coffee like Italians, really. The cappuccino, the espresso, the cappuccino, forget it. It's like, okay, take care. Nice Thank talk. You. Ciao. Ciao. Pre- a presto. A presto. Mr. Quillico, on December 16th, you'll be singing the title role in Verdi's Rigoletto in a telecast from the Met. Could you tell us a little about how you feel as, about Rigoletto as a man? Well, I have to say one thing. I think I identify quite a bit myself as a Rigoletto, not as Rigoletto himself. But the thing is, first of all, he's a father. I'm a father. And anything that touch, touch your children is a thing that uh, uh, is very precious. And the idea that I say that I'm close to Rigoletto, uh, I've been really touched by different things in my life, uh, not uh, mentally or even the family or anything like that. But the thing is, uh, it's one of these things that you are placed in a situation that, for instance, Rigoletto has been. And very often I, I go through excuse the expression, through hardship to do the performance for that reason. Because all of a sudden, uh, the role takes over. And usually, it's the opposite. You're supposed to be the master. But all of a sudden, Rigoletto becomes the master. Plus, on top of that, I have to say, I have done it so many times that I've saw so many sides of Rigoletto that it becomes, like I said, sometimes it's very treacherous for that for that reason. You don't realize you become overpowered by it, and it's uh, it's frightening. During a performance, I saw myself wondering why I will start to cry. I don't know, and I start to cry. There's nothing I can do, and sometimes I saw myself choking because I had to sing, but I was choking, and there was nothing I could do, and that's what it does to me. And this is why I say I have identified myself so much with the Rigoletto personage that it's uh, difficult to explain why certain things happen to you. It's just plainly there. But it's a great feeling, I can tell you that. It's incredible. Yeah. Do you feel that uh, when you're performing in front of a television camera that your style of acting will change in any way? Or I have to say visual? one thing, you should not change it. Because at that point, if you start to change because to accommodate the television, 
In fact, I've done television, I've done regulator for television, and uh, it could be very dangerous. Then at that point, you're minimizing uh, not only the gesture, you might even minimize the interpretation, and you become a little bit false. I believe one thing, when you're on the stage, it's to give all or nothing. That's the way it should be. This won't be your first telecast at the Metropolitan, will it? No, this is going to be the second one. The first one was the mask ball with uh, Mr. Pavarotti. And the funniest thing about it, it's again the Rigoletto with Mr. Pavarotti. That's very interesting. Yes, very, very interesting. You're, in some way, you're tied together you're, well, in your telecast. Well, it seems to, be come, to be coming my good luck charm, I would say. Ah. And I have to say one thing. You know, I've sang so many, so many performances with Mr. Gore, uh, uh, Pavarotti. In fact, he's the tenor that I sang the most in this world. Very interesting. Yes. Mr. Quillico, your repertoire extends into many works by Verdi, Sanson, Massenet, Debussy, and Leon Cavallo. This is just to mention a few of the composers you've sung. Are you looking at any new roles or composers? Well, if we talk about how many opera I've done, I've already performed on the stage over 202 operas. Many, many of them, I would say about 170, to maybe 180 of them, I will never perform again. Uh, some of them is because physically, some of them is, uh, how can I say, um, treacherous opera. Plus on top of that, like I say, there's a lot of them, they will never perform again. And uh, for instance, uh, I'm gonna be doing very soon, Sappho by Pacini, here in New York. The last time I've done it, because I created it in Italy, uh, I would say about uh, 15 years ago, in Naples. It's an opera that I have a funny feeling. After we're going to do it here in New York, that will be about the, the end of it. Because, you see, they're, they're kind of an opera that their specialty. Uh, I did uh, Wozzeck once upon a time, and uh, I refused to do Wozzeck for one simple reason. It's got a little bit something in common, for instance, with Rigoretto. And when I did it, I became completely out of control. Wozzeck took over. And I, I was so scared that I said, I don't want to do these things anymore. And these are the reasons, for instance, that there's a few of opera that did happen, these things. But as, as most of the, uh, as a young uh, opera singer, very often, you are asked to do opera that uh, will never repeat, it be repeated. I've did the uh, Ephigenie en Torre, the Ephigenie en Olide by Gluck. When is it going to be done? Never again. Uh, the Trojans, uh, I've done it. It might come back, might, it might never come back, you know. And this is the reason why uh, many of my repertoire are gone out of my repertoire for that re reason. Plus, other opera, like I used to love to do Bohème, I used to love uh, to do uh, uh, Silvio, uh, L'Elysir d'Amour, uh, Belcore. Well, I have to say one thing, and I have to leave this to my son, because he's got the physique. I don't have the physique. Mm -hmm. It's not the voice is not good for, for this kind of role. I could do mm, tremendous justice to it. But uh, the big problem is, physically, I don't have the physique. And in fact, somebody was telling me one day, well, Louis, if, uh, if a lot of people would uh, approach uh, the career like you do because you feel physically uh, you should not sing a role, he says, there would be a lot of people out of business. I don't mind because for me, you've got to justify what you represent. If you don't, cannot justify, I think it's, uh, it's not good for... And plus on top of that, today the public is very well aware uh, advice of what is, you know. Uh, we should not go on the stage and thinking, nobody there in the hall, uh, they're all stupid. They are not stupid, because there's some of them, I mean, they're just listeners, they don't know much about it, but we'd be very surprised how many people in that hall that knows, maybe not as much as you do, but they know very well what you're talking about. And I think this is the thing that an artist in life very often has to be very careful. If you're not careful, you can, uh, you know, it's a, it's a knife with two, two sides, a cut both ways, and don't play with them. You mentioned your son Gino, who's now having a career in Europe. <laughs> Could you tell us a little about his career and so forth? Well, I have to say one thing, this is a treasure. You know, uh, I think in life, uh, you can have a second chance. 
But uh, can you say having not only a second chance, but a kind of a second life? Because when I say this, it's a simple reaction. Uh, my son singing, it's like part of myself singing all over. And I think it's a great... Uh, God has blessed me more than anybody else in the world. And today, if I, I, I hope not to die right away, but if I would be, the, if I would die, I still say my life is a dream. I'm dreaming. I'm walking. Louis Quilico is there, but it's somebody else there, not me. And I think it's a marvelous feeling. Like I said, I make God a liar. They say you don't find happiness in this world. Not complete, but a great part of it. Yes, because I feel this way, and I think my son has starting to feel that too, and in fact more than I think that he, I think he believes in. To be a singer, it's to be blessed of the greatest thing that the world can offer to a man. And the thing is, I feel sorry sometimes when I, feel, I see people that are using this as a trampoline to be just a, music, uh, uh, a commercial part of their life. For me, it's not commercial. It's a, it's a blessing. It's a, it's a way of life. It's a, how can I say? It's greater than life. You cannot explain it. And this is the beauty of it: being part of something that it's not given to many people. And I think it's it's great. And like I said, to come back to my son, when you think that your son is doing what you have been hoping for yourself. All your life, what is more to be asked about life? It's practically impossible. You're having a telecast in a very, very close time more than period, close. right? The thing is, <laughs> I'm doing the telecast of, of Rigoletto on the 16. And in fact, on the 16, the same day, but it will not be exactly the same day because for him it's going to be like for us, the 17. Mm -hmm. But for him it's going to be still on the 16. Uh, he's going to be doing the... No, in fact, we're going to be very close. In fact, uh, it might be approximately at the same time because he's going to be doing a telecast of the Barbara Civil for the Paris Opera exactly on the same day. And if I, I, I didn't measure, I didn't get the exact time, but I think it's approximately the same time. I have to check on this. Your wife, Lena, is also very instrumental in your career as well. Well, my wife is the instigator <laughs> <laughs> between my son and I, because the thing is, when I say instigator, she is our, our teacher. My wife was my teacher. I became my son's teacher too, but we were both blessed to have my wife, because she's really directing us, both of us. Because the musical background I have, the musical background my son has, comes only from one source, my wife. You see, my wife, when she first started, when I met my wife, she was a concert pianist. And I, break, I broke that career. But like I said, having a second chance, my wife had her second chance. She made for this world two career, Not only hers, but she has participating of making Two great career. I mean, you know, I shouldn't say, but that's the way it is, you know. And I think it's the her contribution toward the music world is incredible. People do a lot of, uh, you know, like Mr. Pavarotti, Madame Renata Scotto. They give a tremendous uh, contribution to towards the music world. But I think in a certain way, in my wife, little ways because it is not known. I think the contribution is even greater because she has created two great career. And my son, I have to say one thing right now, is doing beautifully well in Paris. And it's so funny because uh, I assisted to his debut and very often I've got people that come from Paris and they come and see my performance and they would say, you know, last week we were in Paris, we heard your son. And there's a lady that came to me and she says, you know, I look at your son on the stage, 
and I said, I remember you in New York, seeing you in New York. And she says, you know, I had tears in my eyes because she says, here's the father in America, here's the son in Paris. Isn't that something unbelievable? And it is beautiful, you know. Do you foresee the, that you'll ever sing together on stage? We've, we've done already. Oh, you have? Oh, yes. We did, I did the Rigoletto with him. We did Simone Bocanegra together. In fact, we did a, a joint uh, um, portrait of mine on television. And we're doing the, uh, the duet of uh, Ford and Falstaff. And it's quite interesting because uh, that was practically at the beginning of my son's career. And uh, to see him uh, developed, you know, I, you know, at that point, uh, it was beautiful. Because, you know, the thing is, when you see a young artist on the stage, well, uh, you know, being such a mature artist, you say to yourself, well, maybe I should not be too, too hard and try to help him and not to try to overshadow him. At first, I had that in mind. But all of a sudden, I said to myself, I remember even myself, at the, beginning my, at the beginning of my career, singing with people like uh, Mario Del Monaco or UC Burling, at the very beginning of my career, they did not go around the way to just to say, well, he's a young artist, we're going to try to... No, they gave everything they had. And the funniest thing I did, I did exactly that. And for my son, it was a peak of his career, because all of a sudden, he was as great as I was. And I think that was a great achievement. It proved him one thing, that he could do it. But at the same time, it proved him one thing, that when you're on the stage, you're all by yourself. Nobody else helps you. Do the best you can. Only you. Even if I was next to him, there's nothing I could do for him. And this is the, 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 the thing with the theater that is very treacherous. Because the moment you step on that floor, nobody is there to help you. And I have to say one thing, sometimes it's a very lonely word, word, world, because uh, to be alone there, it's quite a responsibility. You spoke about Pacini's Sappho uh, as one of the roles you'll be singing again. Are there any new roles that you're looking at in a sense of you'll be performing in the near future? Or? Well, in the near future, I've got one that is brand new that I never did before, is Nabucco. Ah. Yes, that I'm going to do that in the spring. Where will you be singing that? Uh, Hartford, Connecticut. I'm very happy to do it because uh, uh, it's funny. Uh, I have heard a performance of it. Was not very much impressed and only realizing now why I was not impressed because the performance was not great. But I realized how beautiful the music is. And for instance, another thing that I'm looking forward very much right now is uh, next fall I'm doing, I'm going to repeat, because I've done a few years back, Falstaff. And I'm going to do Falstaff again. And in, that I look forward to. In looking through the various roles that you've sung, you seem to be very closely tied with Verdi. Very good Verdi, friends. Verdi <laughs> has been a close friend of mine. <laughs> you know, because I have to say one thing. I think in all my old career, I would say 75% if it's not 80% of my performance were always Verdi. And in fact, there was something very funny happened. I went to sing in Torino, and I sang Mask Paul. In fact, with Mr. Bergondi, who just celebrated his 25th anniversary the other night at the Opera House. And uh, uh, the next day, they gave me a check. Usually, they used to give me cash. In other theater in Italy, give cash. That theater gave me a check. I go to the bank. And I come to the teller and I says, I would like to have uh, so many uh, 10,000 lire, 5,000 lire, and 1,000 lire. Good. They gave me the whole money. I came to the 1,000 lire, and I asked for 30,000, 1,000 lire. And the lady, uh, the man, starts to come, pum, 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 pum. All of a sudden, I take the money, and I count the 10,000, I count the 5,000, and all of a sudden, I start, I take the first 1,000 lire, I kissed. I take the second, and I went out, went out, went out. And I see that teller, his eyes popping out, popping out. And I, 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 I could feel his curiosity, build, build, build. And all of a sudden, when I came to the last one, I kissed it. And I says, 
you're curious to know why I kiss this. He says, yes, I'd like to know why. He says, I'm ready to call the police. I says, don't call the police. I says, it's very simple. I says, last night, I sang Ballo e Maschera. That's from Giuseppe Verdi. I says, look on the 1,000 lire. There's a picture of Giuseppe Verdi. And even today, he paid me. <laughs> <laughs> That's a wonderful story. <laughs> but I tell you one thing, it was so funny to see that poor man across there <laughs> looking at me and says, what, what is this not? What is happening to this one, you know? You probably made a day. <laughs> <laughs> yes. <laughs> In fact, you came and see the second performance. I had to give him a ticket for it. Yeah. Well, we'll definitely <laughs> be watching TV on the 16th of December. See well, uh, it's a kind of a, I have to say one thing, to do the Rigoletto, after doing so many performances of Rigoletto, I, because by 1984, I would have signed 500 performances of Rigoletto. That's a lot of performance. And like I spoke once upon a time to another baritone, I says, I would like to be able to shake hand with another baritone that I've signed so many performances of Rigoletto. And this is why I said before, uh, Rigoletto puts you in a mood that nobody can know. Only you can know this. And no matter what anybody will say, uh, uh, talk about Otello, talk about Norma, but I have to say one thing, Rigoletto is a third dimension role that is so great. Unless you are true to it, if you are true to it, you go through an ecstasy that uh, I've got shivers just to talk about it. And it is true, you know, because it's uh, the, the portrait of Rigoletto is such a three-dimensional portrait that you, you don't exist anymore. And uh, it's, anyway, I'm so grateful to be able that it's going to be put, like they always say, in the can, that I think it's, uh, it's one of, I would say, if God permit me to do it, it will be the greatest, greatest achievement of my career. Yeah. That's wonderful. I'm going to, that I have to cut just there. <laughs> <laughs> I'd like to thank you very much for joining. No, we can. Can ahead. I just, sure. before you finish. Absolutely. I have to say this. Once upon a time, once upon a time, it's about seven years ago, six years ago, I did Rigoletto at the Met in the old production that I loved. There's an old man who must have been about 68 years old. It was in January. It was cold. It was below zero, I don't remember. And there was the old man waiting for me outside of the stage door. And it took me about an hour, an hour and 15 minutes before I came out, and it was freezing. And the greatest compliment came from a human being that I can, I, you know, I was marked by it. This man came to me and said, Mr. Quilico, he says, I only hope one thing. The day God wants to take me, please make it that I'm listening to one of your performance, especially Rigoletto. <laughs> <laughs> I'd like to thank you very much for joining us this afternoon in your very busy schedule. And uh, again, please, everyone tune in for December 16th, Rigoletto, with Mr. Quilico as Rigoletto. I, have, I would like to invite everybody, but apparently we're sold out. Well, uh, with the TVs, uh -huh. it, yes. it makes it incredible. We can all see it and share it with you.
Speaking Opera focuses on documenting the career activities of currently active singers, composers, musicians, and authors in the field of operatic performance and scholarship, and specialists in the field of audio recording, as well as those who have retired fully or partially from performing and or teaching. Under Section 107 of the Copyright Act of 1976, allowance is made for fair use for purposes such as criticism, comment, news reporting, teaching, scholarship, and research. Fair use is a use permitted by copyright statute that might otherwise be infringing. Nonprofit, educational, or personal use tips the balance in favor of fair use.